Welcome. My name is Sheila Fleischacker, and I am a National Science Liaison for Nutrition and Food Safety at the National Institute of Food and Agriculture, or NIFA for short. I'm excited to moderate today's 13th edition of the NIFA Nutrition Security Webinar Series, entitled The Development of New Measures to Complement the United States Household Food Security Service Module. Before we get started today, here is our non-discrimination statement and the link will be put in today's chat box. I have the honor to co-lead with Dr. Robert Godfrey, the NIFA Nutrition Security team listed here. Our leadership team also includes Dr. Saluska and Huey, who's moderating today's slides for me. Our team also includes more than 80 NIFA staff. We've been working together since early 2021 to help address the secretary's core priority of tackling food and nutrition insecurity. We were recently honored the NIFA Team Award. I'm really proud of our group. To prioritize nutrition security, NIFA has invested more than 200 million in research, education, and extension, as well as innovation through five key programs listed here. These include the expanded food and nutrition education program featured at last month's webinar series, GUSNIP Nutrition Incentive Program, which was featured earlier this spring, our Food and Agriculture Service Learning Program, our Community Foods Project, and the AFRI, or the Agriculture and Research Initiative Competitive Grants Program Priority Area A1344, Diet, Nutrition, and the Prevention of Chronic Diseases. We are leveraging more than 40 programs listed here. And I wanna spotlight, last week we had our National 4-H um, highlight their youth roundtable, and they gave excellent recommendations for better ways to engage youth in our work ahead. We believe NIFA's integrated approach positions us to help address food and nutrition security research gaps and mobilize our broad and committed stakeholders through education and extension to help us build awareness around how to prioritize nutrition security at the local, state, tribal, and national levels. Before we get started today, a few housekeeping items. Please use the Zoom question and answer function, not the chat box to submit any questions. Please include your name and email if you don't answer any questions, if we don't get a chance to answer your questions live, so we can contact you in the week with response. Towards the end of the presentations today, we welcome questions. We are also actively updating our past and future webinar materials and bolstering our new food and nutrition security NIFA topic page with additional sub pages. Future webinar editions include an October edition focused on our 1890s Centers for Excellence in Nutrition and a November edition focused on the USDA Indigenous Food Sovereignty Initiative with the USDA Office of Tribal Relations. Now, for today's webinar, I want to thank Dr. Mallory Koenig, who suggested the team at the Gretchen Sonson Center for Nutrition. She shared how they are working to develop new measures to complement the US, the United States Household Food Security Service module. As you will learn more today, this center is an independent research institution providing scientific expertise, partnership, and resources to improve diet and physical activity behaviors among youth and their families to grow a healthier next generation. The project that is featured today is not funded by NIFA. Dr. Koenig's, Koenig's works closely with the center who oversees the evaluation of the Gus Schumacher Nutrition Incentive Program, otherwise known as GUSNIP. And this center is the lead of the Nutrition Incentive Program Training, Technical Assistance Evaluation and Information, or the NTAE Center, as we call it for short. Today, Dr. Calloway will cover the development, testing, and potential uses of these new measures in about 45 minutes. We'll use the remaining time for questions and discussion with Dr. Calloway and other members of his team. It is my pleasure to introduce the Gretchen Swanson Center for Nutrition Measures team, which includes Dr. Eric Calloway, Ms. Leah Carpenter, Mr. Tony Garbano, uh, Dr. Julia Sharp of Colorado State University, and Dr. Amy Yarrow, the Center Executive Director. Personally, I have known Dr. Yarrow for more than a decade and am genuinely grateful for her leadership in food and nutrition security research and her partnership here with NIFA on GUSNIP and many other endeavors. I will now pass it off to Dr. 
Yaro, and welcome to Steve's overview. Thanks, Sheila. I think Eric's gonna put up the slides. So good afternoon, and I'm pleased to be on this webinar today. And again, I'm Amy Yarrow, Executive Director of the Gretchen Swanson Center for Nutrition. And I also just wanna start out by thanking Dr. Sheila Fleischacker and Mallory Kanings and the whole nutrition team at NIFA for inviting us to present today on promising new measures to be used to complement the USDA Household Food Security Survey Module. Next slide, please. The Gretchen Swanson Center for Nutrition is a nonprofit nutrition research and evaluation center headquartered in Omaha, Nebraska, but we actually went all remote. So we're all across the US at the, we went remote at the end of last year. And uh, we conduct measurement and evaluation across a variety of topic areas. Again, as Sheila said, we lead the GUSNIP NTAE Center and specifically the reporting and evaluation side of this effort. And then we also conduct program evaluation of national programs for funders, including Robert Johnson Foundation, American Cancer Society, American Heart Association, and many others. In addition, we ourselves have a grants program called Rooted in Evidence to fund and work with food banks across the country to train and increase their capacity for data collection and evaluation. And feel free to follow us on social media. Next slide, please. And then um, through our expertise in measurement and evaluation, we work to develop and validate survey tools so that we can better assess outcomes for interventions or programs that are aimed at improving dietary quality and helping to alleviate food insecurity. And this has led to this current Walmart Foundation funded work to develop and disseminate measures, again, to complement the USDA food security survey module. And really what we're doing is assessing beyond the access pillar. And it is now my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Eric Calloway, who is a senior research scientist at the Gretchen Swanson Center. And so Dr. Calloway graduated with a doctorate in nutrition and with a behavioral focus from the University of Texas and is also a registered dietitian. And he's been with the center for eight years. And his primary research interests include investigating the relationship between uh, socioeconomic policy factors and dietary quality, food insecurity and health disparities, as well as measurement development and program evaluation. And I will now turn it over to Dr. Calloway. Thanks. All right. <clears throat> well, thanks so much for the intro, Amy. And um, I'd like to also thank USDA and NIFA for inviting me uh, to present this work and, and our whole team. And I'm presenting on behalf of our team. And, uh, you know, a lot of people had a role in this. Um, I'd like to also thank um, colleagues that helped on this project, our funder, the Walmart Foundation, and our expert advisory group. Um, who were very instrumental in shaping the direction of this work. Um, also, I'd like to thank all of the sites who were excited about this project and agreed to partner with us and help us with um, all the various data collection tasks that were needed to um, accomplish this work. So first, just I'll introduce the project to you. So this was our ultimate goal. Um, develop low burden measures that were complementary to USDA's household food security module and address critical measurement gaps related to food insecurity that were of interest to both practitioners and academic audiences. We began this work in January of 2020. Here's an overall snapshot of the three main phases of our project. First, the um, formative research included uh, working with an expert working group uh, that it was a diverse group of 14 prominent researchers and practitioners who uh, you saw listed on that slide earlier. We also conducted reviews of the literature and um, helped uh, to help define the constructs that we plan to measure um, to confirm that, you know, the gap areas we identified were actually gap areas and to identify any existing survey items um, that we could potentially borrow and modify um, to help, to help build out the item pools for these measures. And um, we also interviewed nearly 50 people across the country who were experiencing food insecurity in order to better understand their experiences and ensure that our measures were relevant. Uh, next, we did cognitive interviews to refine the items um, that we um, either created uh, new or modified from the literature 
Um, and then we piloted the draft measures in California, Florida, Maryland, North Carolina, and Washington with nearly a thousand participants. We then ran psychometric tests on the data and decided uh, to decide which items to retain and determine the final versions of the measures. Uh, today, I'll mainly talk about our conceptualizations of the measures, uh, findings from, testings, uh, from testing, and some potential applications. So um, through that formative work that I just sort of briefly went over in the previous slide, here are the three gap areas or domains that we arrived at. Uh, within uh, each or within them, we developed uh, nine new measures in total and three, there happen to be three within each domain. And these measures are independent, so they can be used separately or paired or in sets whatever um, is needed based on the objectives of the study or project. Um, so, that, so neither of them have or depend on the others to, to be used. The first gap area uh, we'll go over today is household resilience. So household level financial shocks, such as losing a job or having a large unexpected bill is a major predictor of a household becoming food insecure. A household a financial shock equivalent to $500 is associated with a 20% increased odds of food insecurity among low income households. So the measures developed for this gap area aim to assess a household's resilience against becoming food insecure in the face of a financial shock. So examining resilience at the household level rather than at larger levels such as um, cities and, and states is a relatively recent idea. Um, several researchers working in the food insecurity space and primarily internationally have defined household resilience as being comprised of these three capacities that you see in the model. And I've realized when trying to explain this concept in the past that just um, stating the definitions didn't really explain it well. So I, I put together this model you can imagine a financial shock coming down on that house like rain and like a roof um, absorptive capacity is your first line of defense so absorptive capacity might include things like savings or characteristics of a household's income or expenses that make it more or less able to handle a shock in the near term. Then if a household's absorptive capacity to buffer a shock is exceeded the household needs to react and adapt to the shock in the intermediate term. And so this is adaptive capacity and it's comprised of things like knowledge and skills and efficacy barriers uh, and social support that are related to the people in the household. And this is represented by the core um, of the house where the people live in this model. And then next is transformative capacity, which refers to community level and long term factors that impact a household's ability to modify its resilience in the long term. So these are these are very, things like uh, job availability, uh, resources, transportation infrastructure, long-term outlook, the social environment of the community. Um, so these are all the um, types of things that we're trying to assess with the household resilience measures. And um, so, so next is the availability, utilization, and stability uh, measurement cap. So food insecurity is often conceptualized as having four pillars. Uh, availability is concerned with the physical presence of enough food. Then um, accessibility is kind of one step down and refers to households being able to financially and physically access food that is available. Uh, then next is utilization. So food being available and accessible is not enough. You also have to have the ability to take that food you have access to and produce a healthful meal. Um, and so that's the utilization pillar. And then uh, last is stability, which is the idea that food insecurity can vary with time. So you could have seasonal food insecurity or food insecurity only at certain times of the month, for example. And USDA's household food security module does a very good job of assessing the access pillar, particularly financial access but it doesn't necessarily focus on the other three. So we sometimes call this gap area or domain the other three pillars. And here are all those pillars. And then again, um, 
USDA's module really gets at accessibility. So we skipped that one and we just focused on creating measures for the other three. And we deliberately use similar wording, uh, response options and a scoring approach uh, as uh, USDA's module. So they're worded similarly, same response options, same scoring as USDA's module so that if it was of interest, um, they could be used um, together. Um, and then the last one is nutrition security. So when we started this work, some of the recent momentum in the field, uh, in the US anyway, around nutrition security hadn't quite taken off yet. Um, our expert advisory group though lifted this up as one of the priorities that we should pursue. <clears throat> Here's a model showing some hunger concepts um, including how nutrition security and food security are related. When we started this work, um, there was not an established definition in the US for nutrition security. Here's the FAO definition that um, was around when we started this. Um, this was made for an international context. And we felt that some of the terms here and then some terms and some other international definitions didn't really quite fit the US context. We knew that nutrition security was a larger concept than food security in that it encompassed food security, but additionally was concerned with the healthfulness of food. So um, we knew we wanted to ask questions that were similar to the gold standard, which is USDA's module, but that also emphasized nutrition, the nutritional quality of the food. We also relied a lot on the interviews that I briefly mentioned earlier to shape our concept of nutrition security. Uh, one of the themes that kept coming up in those interviews was this feeling that people wanted to eat healthfully, but felt that they didn't have a choice due to their financial situation. So we heard people talk about how, you know, they would get advice from their doctor on how to eat. Um, here's a quote from one participant who had diabetes. They said, you know, the doctor says, eat more protein and less carbohydrates. And I'm going, that's nice, that's nice. I can't do it, but it's nice. They don't really understand. I don't have control over a lot. Uh, many participants talked about how their wages or um, disability or social security checks only pay for their rent and bills, and they get a small amount in SNAP. Um, in some cases, it could only be $15 a month if they don't have dependents, for example. And beyond that, they're at the mercy of whatever's at the food pantry. So they don't feel like they have control over what they can eat. Um, so we decided to add some questions around this theme into the pool of items um, that we were testing. And um, those, those items ended up holding together into two additional scales that we were not originally intending to create. So one, one ended up being about the control, about the ability to control the healthfulness of your diet. And the other was um, perceived ability to control the characteristics of your diet in general. So being able to consume things that you would like to eat. <clears throat> All right, and then here is at the top is USDA's definition of nutrition security. That was um, not around when we were putting items together for testing, but um, I think what we ended up with aligns well. Um, for this measure, we also decided to use similar wording as USDA's food security module but with an emphasis on healthy food. Um, one, one key difference is um, when we went, we decided to go with a five point ordinal scale rather than the three point scale that the module uses um, due to um, preference by the cognitive interviewees. All right, and then now I'll get on to testing. And I'll start back um, at the top at household resilience and then work back down through the measures. <clears throat> So these are the three measures created for the household resilience domain. Um, and they correspond to those three parts of the house model I showed several slides ago. So we have one for absorptive capacity, one for adaptive capacity, and one for transformative capacity. Here's some example questions so you can get a sense of what we're asking in the survey. For absorptive capacity, it's questions about financial well-being of the household. For adaptive capacity, it's um, questions about financial skills and efficacy and also barriers to getting a job um, or another job if needed 
or utilize, utilizing assistance programs. For transformative capacity measures, um, it, the transformative capacity measure includes um, questions about the community, such as resources and infrastructure and the social environment. And then one interesting thing to point out with these measures is that not only can you calculate a score, but you also get a lot of practical information. So, for example, if I were administering um, this survey in a neighborhood, I could calculate the average score for absorptive capacity, but I could also see what expenses households are having difficulty affording or what job barriers households are facing or what are the issues households are facing um, for accessing assistance programs. And this information can inform intervention approaches in addition to identifying risk. Here's our pilot sample demographics. The samples had a mean age of about 44, ranging from 18 to 89. Nearly two thirds experienced a financial shock in the past 12 months. About three fourths of the sample were women. About two thirds had low or very low food security. 40% had a high school diploma or less. And the sample was fairly racially and ethnically diverse. Here are the exploratory factor analysis findings. Items with loadings below 0.4 or ambiguous loadings were dropped. One exception is the assistance barriers, which you can see there's at 0.36. It provides a lot of great practical information and we didn't wanna lose that item and retaining it didn't impact um, the other metrics that we were assessing. So we did uh, retain it. Absorptive capacity um, had one factor that assessed monetary related issues such as financial well being, expense burden, and stability of um, income and housing. Adaptive capacity had three factors. One factor assessed skills, efficacy, and barriers. Another assessed financial stress, and the third assessed social support. And transformative capacity also had three factors one assessed resources and services in the community. The next assessed future financial outlook, and the last one assessed the social environment of the community. Here's a description of the three measures. The Chromebox alphas were all in an acceptable range. There was no test bias detected for absorptive capacity and adaptive capacity. We looked at education, age, race, ethnicity, gender, and test mode. Um, education did moderate the relationship between transformative capacity score and household food security status, um, but no other moderating effects were detected. So um, if you're using the transformative capacity measure and your sample had came from diverse educational backgrounds, you'd want to investigate whether you need to control for that variable or not in your analyses. Um, the scores for the measures can be calculated easily without the need for any statistical software. They're just mean scores. We intentionally chose a simple index scoring approach to make sure that lower resource organizations could use and score the measures easily. Um, each measure also has a two item screener version that could be used for um, various applications um, and could be used similarly to how the two item food security screener is used that's sometimes called the hunger vital sign. Um, this correlation matrix shows how the uh, measure scores are associated with a collection of related variables. Higher scores were associated with being more food secure, being healthier, having more resilience to general challenges, and that was measured using the Connor Davidson scale, and was associated with increased financial well being, and that was measured using Consumer Financial Protection Bureau scale. Um, also, those who had higher scores were less likely to have experienced a financial shock in the past 12 months. And so these findings were in the directions expected and support the content validity of these measures in this sample. Uh, and then next, I'll, I'll move on to the other three pillars uh, measurement gap. Here are those three measures created in this domain. So we have perceived limited availability, utilization barriers, and food insecurity stability. In these items, um, one difference in these items 
um, to point out is that they were all negative. They're all worded negatively um, because we use similar wording to USDA's module. So higher scores are are bad in this case. Here are some example questions so you can get a sense of what we're asking. For availability at the top left corner, um, you'll notice one is for stores and one is for food pantries. For these questions, these questions went through several iterations and um, it was the cognitive interviews that helped us refine how to ask about availability. So first, we we're going to ask about availability of food within a certain radius around where the respondent lives. And there's um, some other measures that do that as well. Um, but people said, well, I don't really know. I'm only sure about the places that I go to. So we changed it to ask about availability at the places where they get food. And we included uh, many different um, there, there was another question that asked them about all, a bunch of different types of sources where they could get food. Um, the cognitive interviewees then said, well, you know, I really think about stores and food pantries differently, and it's hard for me to think about them both to answer these questions. So we split it and we have um, three questions that ask at the store and then three questions um, that ask at, for the food pantry. For utilization barriers, we asked about things that may make it difficult for households to use the food that they have access to, to prepare a healthy meal. And um, there are some tangible barriers and some intangible barriers in that list. For food and security stability, these are follow-up questions meant to be used alongside USDA's module. For HH2, HH3, and HH4, those are the three household items in USDA's module. Um, when people select sometimes true for those, they get one of these follow-ups we created that ask basically, well, when is that sometimes true? And response options are the four seasons, three different times of the month, and then randomly no certain time frame. And so based on how people respond to HH2, HH3, and HH4, and those follow-ups, if they get one, we can give each respondent a score um, for their level of chronic food insecurity, seasonal food insecurity, monthly food insecurity, and intermittent food insecurity. All right, and here are the sample descriptives, and this is um, these are all from the same piloting process, so um, the samples are going to be very similar across all of these. So. I won't uh, review them each time, but here's the exploratory factor analysis findings. For stability, we had four factors, one for each of the types of stability. For utilization barriers, there were two factors, one for tangible barriers and one for intangible barriers. And then for perceived availability, there were two factors, one for stores and one for pantries. Here's a description of the um, three measures. The Chromebacks alphas are all in acceptable range. Um, there was no test bias detected for stability or utilization barriers. Um, education did moderate the relationship between the perceived pantry availability and household food security status. So when using that measure, you'd want to investigate um, if you need to control for that item and interaction terms in your analysis. The score for the measures can be calculated easily. It's a sum score in this case um, to align with US, how USDA's module is scored. Also, the utilization barriers scale has a two item brief version that could be used for screening purposes. And here's the correlation matrix for these measures showing how they're associated with some, some other variables. For the first four, um, at the top, um, high chronic food uh, insecurity was associated with being in a more food insecure category, as would be, we would expect. Um, and then we see seasonal monthly um, in the same direction, but a lower effect size, and then intermittent, same direction, but again, a, a lower effect size. 
Um, so it would be interesting to explore further, maybe with a qualitative study to understand how these different groups uh, may experience food insecurity differently. And then um, for high chronic food insecurity, scores were also associated with having lower reported general health, consuming fruits and vegetables and scratch cooked meals less frequently, and consuming processed meals more frequently. Um, we saw similar patterns of scores for utilization barriers and perceived limited availability at stores and then perceived limited availability at pantries is also associated with um, being more in uh, food insecure. And again, these findings were uh, in directions expected and support content validity of these measures in this sample. All right, and nutrition security. Here are the three measures that go into this domain. So we had household nutrition security. And then those two that really emerged from the interviews are the household healthfulness choice and um, household dietary choice. Here's some example questions. Um, so you can see um, what we're asking. Um, these all have 12 month response uh, periods and um, never to always five point ordinal response scales. For nutrition security and the healthfulness scales, uh, a term we use a lot in those items, but not, not every item, but many of them, is health and well being. And um, we use that to convey nutritional quality of the food. Um, so we took this approach rather than another approach that might be to define a priori what healthy is. And there's two main reasons we went with this. Um, one was that we felt that it would be um, nearly impossible to have a, a succinct phrase that fully encapsulates what is healthy for all people that you could use in a survey. Um, for example, even um, one of the go-to phrases like using the term fruit and vegetables as a proxy for healthy diets can be problematic for some people, like people who have diabetes, for example, who've been instructed to limit fruit intake, they may have a negative connotation with that phrase. Um, there are very dietary conditions and allergies and preferences and cultural needs that might give people a negative view of even the best constructed brief phrase that's trying to give a succinct explanation of a healthy diet. So um, that was one reason we went in a different direction. Um, but the direction we chose requires people to self define what healthy is. And, um, but we trust that people experiencing food insecurity generally know what eating healthfully means. Um, most people may not be able to recite the dietary guidelines for Americans to you, um, but people know what it means to eat healthfully. There are qualitative studies that show this, and in our own past work, we have seen these findings, and during the formative interviews, this came through as well. Uh, people who are food insecurity know what eating healthfully means in a general and a practical sense, and they want to eat healthfully, but external factors such as affordability uh, prevent them in many cases from doing that. So for many of the items, we use the phrase food that is good for your health and well-being and let the participants self-define what food is good for them and decided we would see in testing if people who scored higher, in fact, did consume healthier foods more frequently. Um, also, it should be pointed out that the nutrition security and the healthfulness choice measures aren't written in a way that assumes people want to eat healthy foods, only that if they wanted to, they could. Um, then the last one here is dietary choice. This one doesn't mention specific foods or qualities of food at all. It only seeks to assess if respondents feel they have the ability to exercise choice over what their diet looks like. So being able to meet their preferences, for example. Um, so here is the um, uh, sample for this. And here is the exploratory factor analysis findings. 
Um, we ran one for the items that did not mention health or specific foods and one for the items that were health or nutrition focused. And so general dietary choice had one factor. And for the nutrition focused items, there were two factors. The first one became the nutrition security scale and the second became the healthfulness choice scale. Here's a description of the three measures. Uh, Chrome X alpha is an acceptable range. There was test bias detected by paper versus online surveys for the nutrition security measure and education and race for the healthfulness control. So um, those variables would need to be investigated in analyses um, to see if they need to be controlled for. Um, there was no test bias detected for dietary choice and the scores can be calculated easily. These are mean scores. And each one had a, also has a one item brief version that can be used for screening purposes. Here's the correlation matrix. Um, these uh, that's showing how these measures are associated with um, some other variables. We see um, high scores for these measures are associated with food security, better health, consuming fruits and vegetables and scratch cooked meals more frequently and processed meals less frequently. And then again, these findings are in the expected directions and support content validity in this sample. Um, one question though we would get when showing these findings to others was, well, what do these show us that we can't already get by assessing food security? So um, we took this analysis one step further. Um, I know you um, can't read all of this, but I just wanna orient you to the table and then I'll zoom in. Um, these are separate logistic regression models looking at how um, scores on these measures are associated with eight different less desirable binary outcomes. We looked at four health related outcomes. So we looked at fair or poor general health, high cholesterol, or hypertension, heart disease or stroke and diabetes. And these were self reported Burfus items. Um, some some were grouped together due to lower sample sizes. Um, and then we looked at four diet related outcomes. We had low intake of fruit and vegetables and low or high in this case was just defined as being below the sample median. We looked at low intake of scratch cooked meals, high intake of fast food and high intake of processed meals. Um, and the columns show odds ratios for models that controlled for different things. Uh, model one was unadjusted. Model two controlled for food security status only. And model three controlled for both food security status and sample characteristics. We looked at education, age, race, gender, children in the household, poverty status, state, and survey mode. The red text is the statistically significant findings. And you can see that even after controlling for food security status and also some sample characteristics, um, that we still see some statistically significant findings in that um, far right column. Here I'll zoom in on the nutrition security um, set of models. We can see that um, some of the effect is attenuated, but we still can say that additional information about health and diet risk is being provided by these measures beyond what you can get by looking at demographics and food security. Um, so after controlling for these, um, you still see significant reduced odds for fair, poor general health, um, high cholesterol or hypertension, diabetes, and being um, below the sample median for consuming scratch cooked meals. So now I'll move on to some potential applications. <clears throat> we feel that there's um, four main uses of the measures. So here on this table, we have some potential uses and then some types of groups that might um, use them in this way. Um, they could be used for needs assessment, uh, evaluation, screening for social risk, and research and or um, public health surveillance. I want to give you a little bit more of a flavor for how these could be used. Um, we're working with a few groups who are implementing the measures now. Um, this slide is about a national nonprofit who wants to implement the measures uh, in a particular area that they serve. 
Um, this partner plans to conduct a needs assessment of the communities that they serve to understand household resilience. And um, this project's still in the early stages, so this is just an example of some potential findings. Um, but on the right side are um, some things I could take away from the data. So in the middle on the right side, um, they might map the scores to identify areas most in need to inform where they could focus their resources. Or um, in, in addition, um, based on responses, they can glean practical information. So they can look at you know, specific expenses households are having difficulty affording or job barriers that communities are facing. So this, this information can help them know not only where to intervene, but how to intervene. This is another project. Um, this partner is a nonprofit hospital system that has a strong community presence. They're looking um, to do intake screening with brief versions of the measures. They already do food security screening, and this is built into their electronic medical records at their hospitals and clinics. Patients who screen positive um, are then referred to one of their food pantries where they're offered food and other services. Um, when patients arrive at the food pantry uh, in this project, they are going to be screened for nutrition security, healthfulness choice, and utilization barriers using the brief one and two item versions of those measures. Uh, and then those who screen positive for low capacity in those areas are identified as needing additional support and they're referred to a dietitian who provides tailored nutrition counseling and enrolls them in a program to support healthy meal preparation. So next steps for this project, um, we have three manuscripts we've submitted that describe the um, development and testing of these measures. Um, one was just accepted in Appetite, and that's the one that, that describes the nutrition security and dietary choice measures. Um, so that one will be out soon. And then two others in review currently. Um, and also we have a call for proposals for studies utilizing the project's data set. Those are due in mid-October. And so um, those who win will get access to the pilot data set that we collected uh, last summer. Uh, the proposed projects just need to use scores for at least one of the measures that we created. Uh, they'll get a stipend, um, plus have open access publishing fees covered. And graduate students and postdocs and early career researchers are strongly encouraged on our website, you can find the measures, some guidance documents, and that um, CFP application. You just go to our website and slash food insecurity measures. Uh, the measures are freely available. They're in English and Spanish right now. We also have uh, Mandarin, both simplified and traditional, coming soon. And we're hoping the researchers will take these and validate them in other samples to show the findings are generalizable beyond our sample. Uh, also, we hope researchers will run additional tests such as some item response theory approaches and confirmatory factor analysis. And we aim to do some of that work as well. Um, and uh, especially we have the measures and guidance materials on the website for organizations who are working with food insecure populations to use in their work. All right, well, thank you all for your time. And I think we're gonna move to the Q&A now. Um, here's some contact information on the screen. You have my website if you have questions about the measures. Uh, again, that's our, uh, the measures website is on there, so you can go there. And I think um, someone's gonna put that in the chat. And then if you have any questions specifically about that funding opportunity I mentioned, there's an email set up for those questions. So thank you all and we'll uh, move on to Q&A. Thank you, Eric. This was a wonderful endeavor that you and your team have taken on at the Gretchen Swanson Center for Nutrition. We greatly appreciate here at NIFA being able to um, launch um, this work and greatly appreciate all the work that's gone into this. You can see a lot of excitement, um, obviously in the work you do by the number of attendees that joined today, um, over 270 plus 100 or more or so registered, and then all the questions that have come in today. So we're going to go 
um, to gallery view. So if you could take your slides down, Amber has been helping us throughout, um, putting in your information. So she'll put that to chat and then we'll get started with all the questions that have come in. So um, bear with me as I, I try to read some of them verbatim um, as we get through the long list of questions today and feel free um, to continue to add questions. We have about 15 minutes. Um, please put them in the Zoom Q&A function, not the chat box. Um, I will go through them in the order in which received. And some of them um, we have answered live, which um, was a key common one. And I'll ask Eric and Amy to answer that one directly is sharing these slides and any relevant resources. So please um, uh, answer that one first and then we'll go through the rest of them. What was that one again? Sharing, sharing your slides. <laughs> oh, share them? Okay. Oh, no, 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 no. Will you share your slides? <laughs> yes, absolutely. So. <laughs> yeah, I think I think you, you're going to have them on the website, right? If I... Yes, so we have a PDF version that we'll share also with the recording. Um, you also have Eric and Amy's direct email, so feel free to reach out to them directly. It can give you the slide decks as well. So I'm going to start from the top um, and again, reading verbatim how the questions come in. You mentioned that these measures will be supplements to existing food security measures. There is concern among some researchers that a new focus on nutrition will lead to restrictive policies within SNAP, school meals, et cetera. How do you balance the interest of supporting healthy food access with the autonomy of those who utilize food assistance? Yeah, well, I think you know autonomy is really important and I'm echoing on my end, so I'm gonna move my microphone back, I think. Also, okay. Sheila, if you wanna mute while he is answering his questions. Yeah, I was just going to say that, um, that, yeah, that that's really important to make sure that autonomy is considered that, you know, there's dignity in food assistance programs. So I think just like you said, it's really striking that balance um, and giving people, um, you know, options that can meet their needs um, and are still meeting some of the public health goals that a lot of these programs have. So I think it, you know, striking that balance is really important, but I don't, I don't have any sort of a silver bullet to, to solve that problem. I think, you know, it's really just compromise and discussion and making sure that there's a lot of community voice involved in making those decisions. Thank you, Eric. And Amy, do you want to add anything? Nope, I'm good. All right, moving down the line. How do you define quality fruits and vegetables and the food availability questions. Does that mean fresh? How did respondents interpret that? Yeah, they, um, so the reason we had that in to begin with was because there's, um, you know, we went to the literature to find items and there's other items that use um, that phrasing, quality fruits and vegetables. And um, to people that meant that, you know, a lot of times what will happen is, is um, people will go to a food pantry and it's, you know, it might be recovered food that may be near the end of its shelf life. So a lot of times they were kind of interpreting it in, in that way that this is food that, you know, um, is going to last to the time that I use it to make meals. I'll be able to store it um, uh, and um, that it's uh, just just has kind of a subjective good, you know, good quality, I guess. And um, it, it again, but that was, it was self-defined, but um, we used it because it was used previously, that phrasing, and people seemed to respond to it and didn't have any issues with it being in there. And so we left it, basically. Thank you, Eric. And Amy, you're nodding your head. Anything to add? All right, moving on. Is there an NA... Um, option for the food pantry question? Yeah, there's there's two items that come before those questions that ask them about the various places that they get food. And so if they select um, food pantries and we use some wording, we had a um, person from Feeding America on our expert advisory group and they had been doing some work around how to word like what is a food pantry in a survey. And so we borrowed their wording, um, but if, if they selected that option, then they would get the food pantry questions. So they had to be someone who uses food pantries to get those questions. Thank you. 
Um, is nutrition security considered one item or collectively are these considered nutrition security? No, there's, um, there's, so in the like nutrition security bucket, nutrition security slash dietary choice, there's one that we're calling nutrition security. Um, and that's the one where the items are worded similarly, similarly to USDA's module, but have an emphasis on nutritional quality of the food. And there's four items for that one, um, but it also has a one item screener version. And then the other two, we're not calling nutrition security. They emerged. Um, so just to back up a little bit, when we did those interviews, we had identified our gap areas and we created interview guides to ask questions about those gap areas. And then within the nutrition security gap area, that's where that theme around choice really emerged. And so we created items to address this choice around the healthfulness of your diet and this choice around just general characteristics of your diet. And so we kept those scales that came out within that bucket of nutrition security, even though it's they're not necessarily what we're calling nutrition security. It's kind of like nutrition security and these two other related scales, maybe we should have said. Um, but yeah, the nutrition security scale is four items and it does have a one item screener version. Thank you, Dr. Galloway, that was very helpful. Next question, is the race and ethnicity breakdown of the sample representative of the general US population? Did you consider oversampling for racial ethnic groups that are more likely to experience higher risk of food security? No, it's a convenient sample. Um, we partnered with, um, uh, five, actually it was seven organizations across five states who serve food insecure populations as part of their work. So it was food pantries, some um, groups that offer um, health assistance to low income groups, um, some other just groups like that that generally work on hunger and food access related issues in the community. And um, we had, we asked them to um, send out the surveys to the people they serve, and each of them had a goal of getting about 200 surveys. Um, and uh, we met with them uh, frequently, I think it was, it was uh, bi-weekly, and the surveys were coming to us and we were monitoring um, sample characteristics. So we were monitoring race, ethnicity, age, gender, a bunch of different things, and we um, we're just basically asking them, is this reflective of the population that you guys serve? And so that's how we were monitoring sample demographics is we we're just working with the sites to make sure they didn't see anything that was far off from what the, the groups that they serve. In a couple of cases, we noticed that we were diverging in some of those demographic groups from populations they serve. Like for example, there was one where we it was really skewing um, higher in age than they typically serve. And so um, we work with them to modify the survey administration approach to get some um, slightly younger participants um, based on some other programs that they are running. Um, but anyway, that's, that's how we, that's how we monitored the sample um, demographics. So they're fairly representative to each site. Um, but not representative, not nationally representative. Thank you. So this is a clarification clarification question regarding model three. You show a new domain like nutrition security is associated with poor health outcome, like high cholesterol, regardless of food security status. So does model three show how a new domain like nutrition security is associated with a poor health outcome, like high cholesterol? Yeah, model three so, controls for food security status and also sample characteristics. All right, I'm gonna move at a little bit of a clip. Um, how do healthcare providers get familiar with these tools and referrals? They're at our website, um, all of the tools are available. So they're all there, um, English and in Spanish and Mandarin coming soon. Um, there's guidance materials online too, to show how to how to a little bit of background on how they were developed, how to use them, um, how to score them, uh, how to interpret the scores. 
Uh, and then also the manuscripts will be coming out soon. So the nutrition security one is coming out in Appetite. Um, it's been accepted. So however long the um, you know process takes for that. And then the other two are in review right now that describe the other two domains. Now, being mindful of our panelists' time and also our attendees, there is about 17 questions left. Um, I'm going to ask Amy and Eric if you guys are willing, maybe in the next 10 or 15 minutes to stay on and kind of clip being recorded. So if those of you have to log off at 2, if our panelists agree to stay on, um, you could listen to the, the last 10 minutes or so as we get through the questions. Is that possible for Amy and Eric? I can stay on. Yeah. All right. Thanks. So this is a pretty dense. The interpreter won't be able to stay on. Okay. Thank you. We'll we'll be conscious of that with the remaining ten questions that we'll we'll note that that one's possible. Thank you both for your incredible services throughout today's webinar. So for the presentation, can you clarify how many questions in total were used in this survey, and how long on average the interview would take? Yeah. So. If you wanted to use all the, so, well, first of all, let me clarify, these are self-administered surveys. So these aren't interview administered. Um, if you wanted to use all of the items across all nine measures, which there's absolutely no reason you have to, but if, if you, for whatever reason, wanted to do that, um, it would be, I think it's 63 items. So um, just to give you a sense, um, the, the full, pilot um, surveys when we piloted them had about 90 measures and those were taking people about 30 minutes to complete. So with 60, I would estimate 20 minutes if you want to use all 60. However, there's no reason you have to use all 60 that you can, you can pick and choose the measures you'd want to use. And do you see the survey being able to be used in non US born populations with low English um, capacity? They were, um, so they're in Spanish and our process for translating them into Spanish, uh, and I should clarify, the, the Spanish translation was all done in California. So it's a lot of people who are from Mexico. So it would be that, um, you know, dialect of Spanish would be most applicable. Um, and so our, our process was we had um, two independent translators do the forward translation. They then met to reconcile any issues. We then had a um, focus group with um, people who were food insecure, who um, were native Spanish speakers to go over the reconciled translation to check for any issues. And then that version was back translated into English. And then we compared the back translation to the original for any conceptual differences. So that was the process for translating into um, Spanish. We're doing a similar process for Mandarin, um, and that should be out soon. But I just Another want to question. jump in and say, I mean, if people want to test them in different populations, we definitely are recommending that because we've even had some folks reach out from outside of the U.S. in Israel and other places, and obviously it would need to be, you know, revalidated within populations. Thank you, Amy and Eric. Uh, last question from this, this attendee. You mentioned research that supports the idea that food insecure people know what eating healthy means. Can you provide some of those references? Yeah, they're in the in the appetite paper. That was one of the comments I got from a reviewer. Um, and so I added some um, language in there and some references. So there are some in there. And also it's something that um, I know I and others at the center are interested in um in studying in the future so um we hope to explore this issue a little bit more thanks eric see the peer review process is helpful here um could you share about the opportunities to use nutrition security household resilience screeners before or in lieu of food insecurity screeners well i i don't think they need to be used in lieu of food security screeners i think these are just additional tools um, that can complement what you can already get from the um, you know USDA's module and their the two item version of it that is the hunger vital sign that's used a lot. So um, you know it's kind of it really just sort of depends on 
what programming you're providing. So for example, that group I mentioned earlier, that's doing some screening at the food pantry level when people come in and they're using that to refer people to different programs. We talked to them about the programs that they offer and then decided uh, work with them to decide which of the brief versions most match that programming. So you, you'd want to have, you know, your screeners match up to some program you can refer people to. So if so, uh, you know, I don't think it's like an either or thing at all. It's kind of they all kind of complement each other and it's sort of based on what programming you can refer people to. And could you um, review who your current partners were? Um, yeah, for the. Um, for data collection or uh, there's a there's a yeah, lot of them. I think, um, I think that would be in the slides. You'll see on the slides. Yeah. All right. Appreciate that. Um, can you also talk about how does this tool compare with existing food and security measurement related tools? Um, well, there. I mean, these are new um, new measures they're not um they're you know they add to our sort of the measures that are out there in the field um, household resilience would probably be most related to social determinants of health measures and so you might think about using them in a similar way where they're a little bit more upstream of food insecurity and then you know the other three pillars measures are um you know that there's an ashby review and some other reviews that have shown that you know, most food and security measures that are out there, not just USDA's module, really are focusing on the access pillar and they're not emphasizing the other pillars very much. So these are tools that, that um, you know, are, are out there now that can be used to assess some of those other pillars. Um, and that's, you know, and of course those are more squarely related to food and security, they're not upstream. And, and then the nutrition um, security measures and dietary choice are sort of a little bit, um, uh, you know, they're related to food insecurity, but, you know, as we showed in that model that, you know, nutrition security is kind of food security plus focusing on healthfulness, um, sort of in a brief statement, you can think about it that way. Um, and so, so yeah, so there, that's, that's kind of how they're all sort of related to each other. And I, I did close down a couple of questions that were more um, oriented towards demographics. I think Eric presented on that and also um, answered more on the Q&A. So I'm going to move forward. Um, thinking through some of the pros and cons, um, what part of the formative discussions included metrics for beverages to go beyond food and meals as it relates to diet quality? Um, we, uh, we didn't include um, beverages in these. Um, we wanted to keep it sort of consistent with USDA's module, like with the nutrition security items and with the other three pillars that were the only ones where food would potentially be mentioned. Um, and so, yeah, so we didn't mention beverages. So that would be um, something that if, you know, if your line of research is focused on beverages, these may not be the best tools for you. And then there's a question, I think more oriented towards me, um, does the USDA endorse these measures? Does the USDA plan to incorporate these measures into current or future work, i.e. population monitoring or program evaluation? I'm really excited about folks taking on, um, looking at food and nutrition and security measures, including the work here done by the Gretchen Swanson Center. Um, our colleagues, many who are on from the USDA Economic Research Service are also doing work of their own um, to conceptualize food and nutrition security um, NIH has put out a notice of interest in this area as well. So there's a lot of bubbling work around food and nutrition security metrics. Um, we are really excited about it, but we're not necessarily endorsing anything besides we use um, our, our current standard measures for the Economic Research Service. So uh, it asks there more questions about that, but essentially we're really encouraging folks to um, explore this area. Um, you could apply to NIFA, to NIH, and various other funding sources like Walmart um, Foundation to support of this. Um, but we, we are not endorsing any particular set at this point. So for, um, could you how can you evaluate the evolution of these measures over time? Is there a permanent survey? Um, I wouldn't say that it's a permanent survey. You know, these are um, uh, put out there and they need to be evaluated in other samples. 
and uh, more testing is always going to be helpful. So I wouldn't be surprised if they get modified over time. So um, I, I don't expect them to be permanent, but you know, I can't can't really speak to the future. And could you speak to uh, how the measures captured uh, households with children? The so these were all adults who responded. Um, some of the households did have children, about sixty percent. Um, and so it's we're operating under the assumption that the representative of the household can speak for the household on these issues. And so similar to USDA's module, you know, you have a household representative speaking um, about the food security of the household. Um, the USDA module, though, does have a, you know, th does have um, eight items that specifically ask about um, food security of the child. And we don't have that those items here. So this is just the respondent speaking for the household and the members in the household, but we don't have a separate subset of questions that speak directly to the child. And anything on ultra processed food intake? There, there is an, one of the items in the healthfulness choice does specifically ask about processed food. And that came out of the interviews where, you know, one of the things we talk to people about is what they usually eat. And you know, a lot of processed food came up in those discussions. And so we wanted to make sure that we had an item about processed food specifically. And we created one and it ended up um, uh, making it through testing and it is in the healthfulness choice um, measure. And this, you talked a little bit about this earlier, but does this survey include a question about whether a doctor or a medical provider has recommend, recommended a modified diet to the participant? Uh, nope, it doesn't uh, ask them about that. Was dietary intake, FFQ, 24 hour recall, et cetera, assessed and were nutritional characteristics correlated with the score somehow? Yep, um, we had uh, dietary outcomes that were in all those correlation matrix tables, um, or at least in the, they weren't in the household resilience, but the other two. Um, and so we, those were um, brief FFQs or dietary screeners, and those are from um, a version of NCI's DSQ that was modified for the FLASHY study, which was another NCI study. Uh, and those were the items that we used to look at um, fruit and vegetable intake frequency, um, frequency of intake of scratch cook meals, which was defined for the survey participant, fast food meals, which was defined for the survey participant, and um, processed meals, which again was defined for the survey participant. Those were our dietary outcomes, um, and those are those were all in the correlation matrix tables. And again, kind of similar question, asking about the relationship between nutrition security and also healthy eating index. Um, yeah, we didn't have um, like a long FFQ to let us calculate an HEI score, um, but you know the measures are out there, and so um, other people can do that work, and I think that'd be great. And then, do you accept CFP from Canadian students? Um, I don't know what we said on that, but um, I think it sure has to be in stress. the U.S. Yeah, yeah it has to be in the U.S. Yeah. Okay, and then one says, I asked the question, um, could people may not screen positive for food insecurity during a hung, hunger vital signs, but indeed could benefit from food access nutrition programs? Um, you know, basically talking about it made the parents feel embarrassed or targeted about nutrition insecurity screening. So any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think one thing with screening that, um, you know, I've heard anecdotally just talking to people who implement that and we, um, some of those interviews happened as part of this work, but we didn't really formally include it. But, um, you know, reading it out loud in front of your children, especially if your children are older or not necessarily children, other family members or friends or whatever, whoever's in the room with you when you're doing that screening, if it's being read aloud, that that can cause, uh, you know, some of that stigma response and, and embarrassment and might cause people to change their answers. Whereas paper forms, that's less likely to happen. Um, so I've heard that that um, you know 
doing it that way is is better with with paper but i don't really have a lot of firsthand experience with um screening in a clinical setting well lots of great questions from our attendees saying a lot of great attendance um throughout i i, I give kudos to your team um, this attendance is really directly related to you guys and your work i think folks are really interested in what folks are exploring around food and nutrition security metrics many other um, emerging concepts. So thank you for sharing your journey and for sharing um, all the responses to these 32 questions. Um, one recommendation was to type up um, these responses. So I encourage you guys, I will work with you in sharing the question list to our panelists and we'll um, have them consider. Um, and when we post the recording and also the PDF, maybe considering adding to their website um, or directly to just these 32 questions um, written. Um, version of the Q&A, and that will also give them a little bit more time um, to, to, to properly respond to all of them. Some of them, I apologize, I didn't answer live um, just for the sake of time. So thank you for being gracious and staying over 10 minutes with us. We are looking forward to two more editions of the NIFA Nutrition Security Webinar Series this year. We're going to have one focused on our 1890 Centers of Excellence in Nutrition this fall and also for November to celebrate Native American History Month. We're going to have our um, colleagues at the USDA Office of Tribal Relations share their work on, on USDA's Indigenous Food Sovereignty Initiative, among other efforts they're working on to increase tribal food sovereignty. So thank you um, for joining us today. We welcome your questions and ideas about this series. Please feel free to reach out to Dr. Calloway and Dr. Yahweh if you have any questions on their work. Please um, join me in congratulating on them on the work underway. And as we saw from many of the questions, there's many things to still do in this area. So please keep it up. Thank you. All right. Yeah, thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks, Sheila. All right. Thanks, Bye. everyone.